the love, enjoy the ride with crystal key tree. Thank you for joining me on another edition of 60 Minutes With. I'm your host, Crystal Petrie, and joining me on the podcast is Gordon Williams. He is an award-winning film writer. He's going to talk to us all about that process. He's also going to tell us what he looks for when he's looking for actors, and also how does he fund his project. So welcome to the show, Gordon. How are you today? Doing well, and you? I'm doing excellent. I'm doing excellent. As you can see, I am back home. Lamar University is where I received my mass communications degree, and Gordon helped me with that tremendously. Yes, welcome back home. And it's always good to see our students flourish and become successful professionals, and then it's always good when they return and come back home. Absolutely, and give you kudos for helping. So okay. I definitely want to do that and give you your flowers for helping me. But let's jump into this. You wrote a movie called The Example. Yes. It's about a 1943 Beaumont, Texas race riot that I had never heard of, but we'll get into that. Can you tell me about this movie? Well, to go back uh, to the beginning, back in the early 2000s, I saw a line in a book that said that there were race riots in Los Angeles, Detroit, and Beaumont, Texas in 1943. Wow. And that was it. Okay. <laughs> no explanation? No anything else? No. Growing up in Texas, you know, being taught Texas history, <laughs> this is something that never was taught to us in the classroom setting. Exactly. So. Which is why I've never heard of it as well. Mm -hmm. So. I got with one of my colleagues, Y. Cagle, and we started doing research, and uh, we attempted to start doing a documentary. We did some interviews, but it did not take off the mm -hmm. way we wanted it to, so we sat on that footage until 2012, mm -hmm. and we decided we wanted to do something with that research. At that time, Wyatt was starting just getting ready to become a father, and Kenneth Dupuy, the other producer, was staring at fatherhood as well. So it was on the horizon for both of them, and that caused me to start thinking about my father and his influence. So we took the research, the inspiration of fatherhood, and we came up with a fictional tale set during the 1943 Omar race riot. So that's how the example came to be. And why was it important for you to tell this story? Well, it's a little known history fact, or it was. We've had some success in introducing the story more to people. So in 1943, Beaumont was a huge shipbuilding uh, manufacturer for World War II. So there was a lot of people coming in to the area. Blacks and whites were working at the shipyard. They were also living in close quarters uh, with racial tensions and segregation and all those things happening at the time. It kind of made things very uncomfortable. There were uh, food shortages and housing shortages and a number of things that just made life uncomfortable. At the beginning of June, there was an alleged rape. Well, no, there was actually a rape of a white woman or assault by a black male. A uh, couple of weeks later, there was another incident, alleged incident. Uh, and this was also around the time the Ku Klux Klan was planning a rally in the area and the black community was getting ready for the Juneteenth celebration. In Beaumont, Texas. Yes. So. All of this on. just led to a pot of keg, and after that second alleged assault, uh, the person that was assaulted was the daughter of a shipyard worker. So thousands or hundreds uh, from the shipyard marched down to the jail because they heard the person was captured. Uh, the Beaumont police chief would not turn the alleged attacker over to them. So in anger, 
uh, a mob of anywhere from two to four thousand went into black neighborhoods. Now we're talking about a, a mob of white men. Males, okay. Yes. Uh, went into the black neighborhood and destroying homes and businesses. So immediately, uh, thousands of black people left the area. Uh, city was under martial law for three days. So that's a powerful story. That is. Within itself. So uh, I wrote a script about a black family and a white family. Uh, the black family had just lost their home in this. And the head of the white family was a police officer having to go out in the right. And their worlds collide at a roadblock to where uh, the black family is just trying to get out of Beaumont safely. Right. But it's also against curfew. So it's about the tension that happens at the stop. Why do you think we have never heard about the Beaumont, Texas riots? We are in the city. We've heard of the Tulsa riots, at least most people have. We've heard of the Rosewood massacre riots in Florida, at least most people have. But we live here in Beaumont, Texas, and this has never been taught in the schools. Elected officials have never said anything about it. Why do you think that is? Well, there are some officials in, that have talked about it and uh, has even used the example, the movie, to have discussions about race because the project is about commonality. It's about oh. humanity. Yes, this horrible event happened, but as creators, why Kenneth and I wanted to create a project that would create understanding. Uh, when we were doing production, I remember seeing internet comments saying that we're going to start another race war with producing this movie and why are we letting these Hollywood filmmakers come in and tell this story? And it's just like, not Hollywood, I guess we're, Local. we're Piney Woods, we're going to triangle <laughs> filmmakers. <laughs> Uh, there's a talented group of people in this area, so projects like this, and they will talk about us, about the Charlton Pollard neighborhood, and uh, projects like the Potter Horn that Jeremy Hawa is taking around the film festivals. It allows us to show the talent that we have here in this area, and hopefully we can build more of a production industry in the future. Do you think that communities, I know with your movie it was Beaumont, Texas, but just communities in general can heal from things like a race riot? I know they say time heals all, but do you think it actually does? Time does heal, but I think there has to be conversations. Yeah. Uh, when we started with the documentary, Back in the early 2000s, there was people that were reluctant to talk to us about it, black and white. Uh, the production crew was actually asked to leave a person's house. Wow. You know, they agreed to the interview. We came in and started setting up stuff, and they didn't feel comfortable talking about it. Even when we premiered the example at the Jefferson Theater, crowd of 350 people. Um, there were a few people that were there and made the comments that we sh should have never brought this to light. So there's still a sense of fear there. Mm -hmm. But for us to have a better understanding of each other, I think conversations need to be had. We released this film in 2016. But due to the things that have happened in news media, society, this project keeps coming back up. It has a rebirth. As filmmakers, we appreciate the fact that people see the value in our work, but it's the social ills that are bringing. Right. And that's kind of difficult to It's weigh. bittersweet. 
Indeed, but it gives us an opportunity to show the film and go out and have conversations. Uh, we said that, you know, it's always great to have it on the big screen, but it's about having it on the small screen in people's homes so they can have conversations about the choices that they make and possibly seeing the repercussions of those actions. Within the movie, the example, I noticed that the wife of the police officer, white man, white wife, and the wife of the man trying to just get his family out of Beaumont and get them to safety, seem to be the ones that helped um, quell the violence between those two. I felt like the women played a pivotal role in that. Why would you, why was it written like that? Well, <laughs> we jokingly said that if the men would have just listened to their wives. <laughs> Absolutely, I'm in agreement. I'm in agreement. But no, I think um, for me in writing those parts, I think the women created a sense of purpose, a sense of grounding. So I think that was that was important, that was necessary. It softened them in a sense, but I think it also gave them perspective as far as I have to take care of my family. <laughs> right. Yes. 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 But also seeing the commonality in each other. Right. You know, Miller was concerned about his wife's safety. This is why he was going out to do his job as a police officer. While Carver is concerned about his wife and his son's safety. safety. Those two men have a moment when they see each other in that piece. And that moment needs to be discussed. Yes. Now, this movie was difficult for me to watch. It was very good, very well written, but emotionally, it was difficult for me to watch. How did you manage to write that script and then actively live through, participate in bringing it all together? Well, <clears throat> emotionally speaking. Well, working with uh, Wyatt and Kenneth, we had to have a lot of difficult conversations. So Wyatt and Kenneth are two white males. So we had to have a understanding about what is this project about? Mm -hmm. What type of environment are we going to create for actors to get to a place right. to feel safe? Yes. But also to create an environment to where the production crew understood the importance of the story and everybody was on the same frequency. Yes. What is your hope for this movie, The Example? If you would have told me that seven or eight years after releasing this project, we would still be taking it to colleges and universities along with the Charles Apollo documentary. I wouldn't have thought that was a thing. But with the example in the Charlton Poly documentary, we've had an opportunity to tell Beaumont's black history that hasn't been seen in that medium before. So the Charlton Poly documentary, LUTV Productions students got hands-on experience on the set and they got paid. Really? Yeah, so they had the opportunity to connect with that neighborhood's history and the people. So the creative things that we're doing with production here, it's giving opportunities, it's enlightening people about the past, it's helping people financially. So we want more of that in this area. And I, I think we're working towards that. In the movie, The Example, the white characters, I felt like, had such a difficult role to play, such a difficult character to embody. How did they manage to do that? 
embody those roles, say such vitriol, and I know as actors, that's your job, you gotta right. make it believable, make the people watching, you know, believe that that's what you think and that's how you feel. But as the white characters, how were they able to do that? And how did you, I guess, coach them, for lack of a better word, coach them into those roles and out of those roles? Well, Wyatt Cagle was the director of the project. He's okay. very talented. And again, the conversations that Wyatt, Kenneth, and I had set the tone for the set, but also creating that space for those actors to be able to not think about that, mm -hmm. to truly embody the role was definitely important. Uh, Jeremy Allen, Mark Isaacs, who played the Officer Bernard, and Kate Robards, who's actually a communication department graduate. Um, they understood the material and they researched. Okay. And from talking to them, they had personal experiences of things that they saw. So okay. I think every actor has to be able to pull from something personally along with research to get to a place to like fully embody the characters and I think um, those that I mentioned and uh, Emma Van Lair and Kendrick Brown and Evan Horsley I think the black family they did that <laughs> we were amazed by the performances I was too it was so believable um, now about 15 minutes into the movie mm -hmm. you see the white officer officer Harvey point his gun at the little black boy in the car he actually pulls the trigger but there's no bullets and I felt like that was a pivotal moment in the movie why was it set up like that and what were you trying and Wyatt and the others trying to portray in that moment? It's about action. Well, let me go back. It was a pressure situation. Very. So you need to be, you should be clear headed, <laughs> mm -hmm. period. So when pressure situations come, it doesn't necessarily affect the way that you act, but this was a, this could be my life. <laughs> right. And that first instinct is to protect yourself. I wanted people to question their actions. It may not be pulling the trigger, but your actions with your words are the way you talk to people. Right. The way you conduct yourself, there are repercussions, positive and negative. There are repercussions that you may not be aware of. So having mindfulness is definitely important. What do you say, and you've talked about this just a little bit already, but what do you say to people who say, enough with the slavery, enough with the racism, why do we keep having to pick at this gap? Just let it go already. I'm a big believer in know your history or you're doomed to repeat it. Mm -hmm. And instances keep happening to where seeing similar things from history. <laughs> so, or repeating themselves. Right. So what lessons are we not learning? Mm -hmm. um, and then also there, is, there are generations then have not had the opportunity to learn history. Or we're not paying attention to it. Mm -hmm. So I don't think people are reading as many books anymore. So being able to be entertained. And through entertainment, we were able to give people 
history. <laughs> I feel like if you can entertain people, they're more willing to retain and learn. So if people were just entertained by the movie, they know that there was a race riot in Beaumont, Texas in 1943. <laughs> so was the goal accomplished then? Yes, um, definitely. Um, and again, the fact that we're still able to take this around and have these conversations at colleges and universities. Uh, went to Prairie View, Sam Houston State showed it at Lamar, Stephen F. Austin. We're able to go in and talk about everything from the production elements to the history. So we're, we're crossing multiple disciplines here. Okay. And we're having powerful conversations. And I think that was our goal. We wanted this to be a conversation stuff. Okay. Now, I have two questions. They're kind of similar. First question is, did you have any pushback from making this movie, which you've referred to a little bit earlier in the interview, but if you could just go a little bit more into detail about that pushback. And the second question is, was there any fear on your part or Wyatt's part for making this movie? Because a lot of times we've heard the stories when people make movies like this, people come after them and there's a fear element because I'm telling this story. So we were working on the script in 2012, 2013. Mm -hmm. So this was around the time of Tamir Rice, Baltimore, Ferguson, and all these things. Right. So we okay. were having discussions about whether we should even make this project because we didn't want it to seem as if we were trying to capitalize mm -hmm. <laughs> on the pain, the anger, the hurt, and the situation that's going on in America. So that forced us to make sure that we were pinpoint <laughs> on the story that we're telling mm -hmm. and make sure that we had total agreement of moving forward. I had conversations with people that were concerned about those type of things. I just kind of feel like telling the story has been a part of all of our purpose. So I think you just walk into that and trust that all will be well. And it has been. I'm glad. I'm glad it has. Now you received, which is why I call you an award winning, <laughs> even though you roll your eyes every time I say that, but it is true. It's on record. You received the special congressional recognition from the office of U.S. Representative Brian Babin. That's a mouthful, but it needs to be. It needs to be. What did that recognition for this movie, the example about race riots in Beaumont, Texas, mean to you? And then not only that, it's just also the Charlton Pauly documentary and the work that I've had the opportunity to do here at Lamar University. So I'm still wrapping my head around that event um, to have an opportunity to stand in front of family and friends and people that I love and still be on top of the ground. Okay. Not everyone has an opportunity. At all. So the event happened in June and I am still processing. <laughs> so it was definitely not on the radar. and. Um, trying to understand and what this means for a creative and what other opportunities can be created from this recognition. Because again, these projects were made in Southeast Texas. There are a number of people that have graduated from this program that want to be here. So this recognition along with the success of the documentary and the short film and other projects in this area, we're building momentum. And hopefully that's solidifying 
the talent base that we have here in this area. Yeah. So again, it's just every project that we do or every accolade that comes, it's just taking that energy and hopefully moving it to the next thing. Now tell me about your upbringing. What was it like for Gordon Williams growing up? Growing up, um, nuclear home, you know, mother, father, mm -hmm. younger sister, uh, grandmother lived with us. So my mother was an educator. Uh, my dad was a measurement technician for a oil and gas company. Um, jokingly, people would say we had a Huxtable lifestyle. <laughs> Did y'all? Um, like looking back on it. Our parents thankfully introduced us to things, you know, being introduced to going to stage plays and all that kind of stuff. and you know, music and art and um, definitely had a, opportunities. So it's just like taking advantage of them. Uh, mother being an educator, English teacher and high school counselor, you know, that education thing was always there. Always present. Yes, yeah, she was one of the first to go to University of Texas. <laughs> so. One of the first African Americans? Yeah. Um, back in the 60s, early 70s. Really? So, and then also my grandmother, her and her husband um, owned, the large, owned the oldest black business there in Cleveland, so the public service station. So, at its peak, you know, there was a cab stand, there was a diner, and other amenities there on the corner and in my childhood and stuff it was just like just a store and my uncle would work on cars and stuff and they would sell gas and stuff so uh, kind of always seen an entrepreneurial spirit there and I understood what that business provided for the community so it was definitely perspective um, I was sick a lot growing up, mm -hmm. so I was in the house a lot, and that kind of allowed me to start writing and drawing and doing all the creative things. So that's kind of where that stemmed from. And what did you want to be <laughs> when you when I grow up? I want to be. You're definitely gonna laugh at this, but um, I wanted to be in entertainment somehow, somewhere. Really? Yeah, always. Really? So I was, uh, you know, I have my sister and my cousins, we would all be in there uh, learning dance moves from the audition videos no. and troops, <laughs> troop videos, <No. laughs> you know, and, uh, you know, I always wanted to be like a part of a boy band or a, a singing group or be the next baby face. Yes! But, um... <laughs> The musical skills did not come through. Okay, I just missed it. <laughs> yeah, but no, I knew I always wanted to be in entertainment in some capacity. Mm -hmm. I mean, you're one of few people who were like, okay, when I grow up, I want to do this, and then you actually grow up and do that thing. Yes, and I've done, I've done a lot. I've done a lot for being in this area, so I'm definitely thankful to my family and friends, the creative colleagues that I've worked with throughout the years. And uh, choosing to come to Lamar University when the television program was just coming back in the mid 90s was huge. It gave me an opportunity to create my own uh, music video entertainment show called G-Sharp that helped me get a- I remember that, yes. Get a uh, internship at BET. I remember that. Yes. I remember that. Um, who introduced you to movies, to writing, producing, directing? Those saying is, you know, if you can see it, you can be it. Did you see someone or just watching TV, being at BET, 
did that make you feel like I can do this too? It was being a child and sitting in the middle of the floor, just watching news and watching movies, <coughs> excuse me, and wondering how this all came together. So it was just that curiosity that kind of led me to come to Lamar University. And when I had the opportunity to do a couple of internships at local stations and uh, shadow some people and when we were able to create G-Sharp with my friend Shamari Franks and we had a crew of nine people and we had the show going for a year and a half. I remember that. So I think it was at that moment, yes, I can do this, but how? <laughs> right. So. Right. Oh my goodness. Let's move on to your documentary. It is, They Will Talk About Us, The Charlton Pollard Story. You wrote this, produced it, and directed it, correct? Yes, and it was also produced uh, with Jonathan Tippett, and he was also the editor as well. So their project came to be because ExxonMobil approached the Department of communication and media wanting to give students an opportunity to get hands-on experience working on media projects. So the idea of doing a 15-minute 15 15 minute documentary about the Charlton Pollard, the oldest black neighborhood in Beaumont, was pitched and immediately Jonathan and I started researching. And uh, it's a fascinating story. It's I've never seen individuals love a community and a high school as much as the people at Charlton Pollock. That is ever true. And we're going to get into that. Uh, but first, why did you feel it was important to tell the story of the Charlton Pollard community, which is located in Beaumont, Texas? Mm -hmm. Why did you feel that was important to tell? There's multi levels to that answer. So, providing opportunities for students, being able to work with them and give them opportunities is very important to me because I always wanted to try to create opportunities that I didn't necessarily have when I was in this department. What surprised me was the student's connection to the people that we were interviewing. The people that we were interviewing from Charlton Pollard and the neighborhood felt seen. Everybody wants to be seen. Yes, yes. So, to be able to watch the production crew have an appreciation for those interviewees and the stories that they were sharing, but also those interviewees realizing that these people respect us enough that they're wanting to share and tell our story. Mm -hmm. And we've had opportunity to share that at a film festival international. <laughs> so people are being introduced to the story of Charlton Pollard and it being built on the cornerstone of education and how the neighborhood flourished and you know the artists that came through on the children's circuit and you know the greatness of the football team and the athletics and the academics and stuff. I was hoping that this would be inspirational because there's other black communities that have similar stories. But also, it's not just a black story, it's a community story. It absolutely is. Having the opportunity to go to screenings, to see people that don't look like me, wishing that they had that high school and community experience. 
lets us know that we created something that works on a universal level. And personally, that's been the goal for me. I want to create content that touches people on a universal level. Do you feel like that content, and I'm just specifically talking about the, your two uh, films, the, the example, and then the Charlton Pollard story, both based about on African Americans for the most part. Do you feel like that's the direction that you are going to go as you continue in this space, telling the African American story, but letting people know it's not just African American history, it is American history? That's a part of it. So, I never thought I would be so ingrained in the his history aspect because I've always wanted it to work more entertainment, more narrative mm -hmm. uh, type of media and content. So, I'm learning a great deal uh, navigating the history discipline. I've had the opportunity to speak at the East Texas Historical Meeting in Nacogdoches and the Texas State Historical Meeting there. And I'm seeing that there's a gap between historians and creatives. Okay. And I think that needs to be filled because there are great stories that need to be shared. So this is a part of it, but no, I still want to do the romantic comedies and romantic dramas and stuff. I want to create. Mm -hmm. And that's, you know, if it's working in television or a film or, you know, on the dance floor, it's all, it's all a part of the creativity that I enjoy and I'm passionate about doing. Within the documentary, they will talk about us, the Charlton Pollard story. One of the people you interviewed said that they celebrate the, the Spindletop explosion, the all boom here in Beaumont, Texas. They celebrate that every year, but they don't celebrate the Charlton Pollard community, even though the community is the oldest black community in Beaumont, Texas. Do you think that's true? And if so, why do you think that celebration is not there? Well, I think while watching the documentary, I believe you heard the statement, this is just part of the story mm -hmm. or the introduction to the story. Mm -hmm. And it is. And we're hoping that people go learn more about the Charlton Pollock neighborhood or their neighborhood. This documentary is a celebration <laughs> of what this neighborhood has accomplished and the effects, the ripple effects through the people that is still moving. Mm -hmm. So I think it's it's communication, it's the knowledge is there. It needs to be captured <laughs> and shared for there to be a deeper appreciation. It has to be introduced to the following generations. Mm -hmm. If people know more that appreciation grows. I think everyone that you interviewed or that was interviewed for this documentary spoke and really bragged about, and they should have, the fact that within the Charlton Pollard community, they had their own doctors, their own lawyers, their mm -hmm. own restaurants, their own teachers, their own schools. Do you think integration destroy that community, not speaking Charlton Pollard specifically, do you think integration destroy that or do you think segregation saved it? I don't know if I'm going to use the word destroyed or not. Okay. I think having blacks, African Americans having more options at that time that they never had before. That's alluring to everybody. <laughs> if there's a new restaurant that opens up. Everyone's gone. Everybody's gone. I believe that, I hope that in the future that those options can be appreciated, can be enjoyed, but also realize that 
within your own community, mm -hmm. that infrastructure and those things can be built and maintained and can flourish and realize that if that is there, people outside see you as an option. <laughs> yes. Yes. I never thought about it like that, but you are absolutely right. If you support other people will too. Mm -hmm. Yeah. In the in this documentary, which was really eye opening for me on so many levels, one of the people that was interviewed stated that their dollars stayed in their community, which goes back to when you support your community, others will as well. They supported their restaurants, they supported the grocery stores, they supported the churches, everything within Charlton Pollard, the dollar, the black dollar stayed within that community and allowed it to flourish. As I was doing research for this interview, I found that the black dollar now only stays in the black community for six hours before it leaves and goes to another community. Can you tell me, maybe your best guesstimate, what has happened from the times of Charter Pollock community where their dollars stayed in their community and supported their community to now the dollar only stays for six hours and then it's gone? That's something that Johns and I kind of talked about and wondered about. Um, there are opportunities for entrepreneurs, but that's a lot of work. It is. That's a lot of you. You're an entrepreneur yourself. And it is a lot of work. Yes. You talk about the highs and lows mm -hmm. and at times you have to sacrifice this to make this happen. Yes. Sometimes those financial opportunities are not given <laughs> mm -hmm. to be able to put businesses in that place. Sometimes the education is not there <laughs> for that to happen. Sometimes it's just the desire is not there. Right. Okay. Why do all this work when I can just go here? <laughs> mm -hmm. So it's a combination of things, and it's more things than I'm even just mentioning now. So I would definitely like to know the answer to that. I would too. Mm -hmm. I would too. The historian in the documentary talked about vividly how the Charlton Pollard community, the economic growth that came from that community directly impacted the economic growth of the city of Beaumont, Texas as a whole. Mm -hmm. Do you feel like the city of Beaumont acknowledges that and understands what this community did for the city as a whole? I think the documentary and the conversations surrounding it mm -hmm. are creating conversations about it, a deeper appreciation and understanding. Okay. All the people interviewed uh, talked about the importance of education mm -hmm. within the community of Charlton Pollard. The teachers cared, the students cared about their education, the parents cared about their education. It was even a story uh, within the documentary. Uh, the lady said she was walking down the hallway with no school books mm -hmm. and an uh, older gentleman came up to her and was like, where's your books? Mm -hmm. And she was like, well, I'm going here. I don't need my books. He was mm -hmm. like, you're in school. You always need books. Right. And he walked her back to her locker mm -hmm. just so she can have books. You're in school. Right. Do you feel like because school uh, is given, so to speak, it's free, so to speak, now that the generation does not value education as much as that community in Charlton Pollard did those years ago? Part of me feels like it's difficult to compare the two because okay. just timing, uh, history also because again, education was one of the only main pathways for improvement, for enrichment. Right. 
I feel like today there are so many other <laughs> routes. avenues. Yes. So um, whether you go to college or not, completely your decision. No judgment in any way. But it's also it's just like you can go find a job that will pay you sixty or seventy thousand dollars out of high school. <laughs> yeah. And that can take care of your family. That's an option. <laughs> For some people, it's athletics. It is a way for improvement. I don't. I don't know if I. Education is still important, but at times it's the means. To an end. It's a means to an end, but it also, how is that education being given? <laughs> Is it being delivered in an entertainment, entertaining manner to where students will want to latch on? But also, are the students being supported <laughs> outside of the school to stress the influence of education? Right, because a lot of times within the documentary, the people that were interviewed talked about it wasn't just the teachers, but it was the teachers, it was the parents, it was the the person at the end of the street, Correct. it was the neighborhood, it was the, the person that worked in the restaurant. So mm -hmm. everyone came to help each individual student when it came to education. Exactly. So hopefully that mindset can return, but it has to be fostered in teachers or stressed. <laughs> yes. They have a lot going on. Yes. So a deeper appreciation for education in the profession, but also outside of the profession needs to uh, needs to elevate. Ooh. And maybe their community sense of the importance of education can be in steel. So we were talking about the businesses. Well, <laughs> right. that education can lead to commerce and opportunities mm -hmm. and growth. So they all build on top of one another. Right. Jefferson County, Texas Commissioner Bo Alford said the stories of Charlton Pollard, the education, the commerce, needs to be told. How do you feel? that can be done. I mean, starting by watching the documentary is a start, but mm -hmm. people have to have that thirst for knowledge mm -hmm. or wanting to learn how did somebody else do it. <laughs> right. Can I take what I know mm -hmm. and possibly improve on that? There is so much wisdom in these communities that can be accessed with just a conversation. It's communication. I'm still learning about this neighborhood and the importance of it, but it also made me have a deeper appreciation for what my grandparents went through owning their store in Cleveland, Texas. Right. The education part of it Did not realize the influence of Prairie View A and M University to Black educators in the state of Texas, mm -hmm. and that notion came up a great deal in doing research and in interviewing people for the documentary. And I had an opportunity to go show the projects there, and I realized that all the educators that they talked about. <laughs> My mother's educators. Really? All that lineage was all through Prairie View. Oh my goodness. And you know, I was actually in the building, um, Don Clark, he used to work at the FBI, very successful. 
He's from Cleveland, Texas. <laughs> he was in my mother's class, I believe. So again, you see how that education branches out. <laughs> yes. And really, it, it feels like it touches everything mm -hmm. and everyone. Mm -hmm. um, now, within the story, speaking of uh, education, within the documentary, they talked about, which I did not know, that people from as far west as California was coming to Beaumont, Texas to be educated at Charlton Pollard High Schools and the schools here in Beaumont, Texas. But even watching that and listening to that, I can see that the population is aging. How do we keep the story fresh and vibrant and keep it relevant for the next generation when this generation is no longer with us? I think your documentary is a great start, but what do you see as the next step in keeping the story going for the next generation and the next generation? Older generations should be willing to share. Mm -hmm. Younger generations should be inquisitive and ask questions and learn. So it's a constant, <laughs> it's a constant wheel. Yeah. Okay. Now, when you, as a writer, producer, director, award winning, <laughs> <laughs> when you are looking for actors for your movies and your documentaries, what are you looking for? Like, what is the it that you're looking for that makes you say, Jeremy Allen, he's perfect for this role? For the example, due to the subject matter, we need a talent. Mm -hmm. <laughs> we need a skill. Okay. We we needed an understanding of the material. Okay. Emma Van Lair when she came in and auditioned for Gladys, the black wife in the film. Kenneth Wyatt and I were almost moved to tears. Really? from her audition. Sometimes people just walk in the room and you know that that's it. <laughs> Sometimes you see the potential and you know that along with work and the research and having conversations and with direction, people can get to that place. Some people don't audition well, but when they're called to be on screen, <laughs> the magic appears. As far as the process, it's it's so in the moment. Mm -hmm. Kismet, it's just, it's a feeling. But also, <laughs> financially, you know, these are small budget productions. So are people going to be willing to come out and play ball for what you're offering? And it's sometimes it's more than just about the money. It's just like it's very much like dating. It's like, yes, I want you to be a part of this project, mm -hmm. but the actors are like, do I want to work with these people? Yeah. <laughs> are they paying me enough? Yeah. <laughs> are they professional enough? <laughs> yes. Am I going to enjoy my days with these people because this is my life, and my life and time has value. So. Mm -hmm. You're courting and you're hoping that you have a good relationship. Also with the material for the example, it was rare for actors to have an opportunity to connect with something of that depth. So there was an the interest there. If someone wants to be a writer or a producer or a director, all three, much like yourself, what is the pathway for that? Is there a pathway? For is there a direct pathway? No. I know it's not a direct pathway, but maybe a generalized one? So, as far as film, uh, I took 
the first film class offered here by O'Brien Stanley. I love Professor (laughs) Guess. So, I took that class because the summer that I was interning at BET, I went and saw this film called Half Plenty. Okay. And it's just like, I could write and do something like this. (laughs) Yes, you could. So, so (laughs) I started, um, I ordered a copy of the script of Soul Food. You can do that? Yeah, you can order. You, now you can download scripts online for free. But it's just like, I got that script and I looked at it and I mimicked what they were doing in the script. Okay. So I took that and wrote a short film called The Dance. And I had the opportunity to make that project in that first film class. So that was it. So it was a mix of just curiosity and the education part definitely played into it, but I didn't go to film school, so it was very much the school of hard knocks okay. in filmmaking, just kind of figuring it out as it goes along. And I have my previous projects on my YouTube page. Mm-hmm. I still cringe at watching them sometimes, <laughs> but why? Well, it's one of those things to where. And I guess because I work in a place of education, I want to inspire creatives to know that it's okay to be at this point and at this point and for you to see your growth. And again, do my creative colleagues and students here make fun of (laughs) of the growth at times? Mm -hmm. Yeah, but again, they understood that <laughs> this is a step, this is a process. Mm-hmm. Even with working with the students in LUTV News, the constant question is working with them throughout the semester, do you see the progress? I can tell you I see the pro- progress all day long, but you need to be able to understand do you see the pro- progress, do you see the steps? So, when I watch a dance and then I see the story of Marcus Arena, I see growth. Okay. From Marcus Arena to the greater ambition, I see growth. And if I'm able to see growth, and also the projects get larger because those previous opportunities have allowed me to work with a larger group of people. So, they're seeing the value (laughs) Mm -hmm. in what's being put together. Speaking of uh, the value and things like that, what for creatives and people who want to create documentaries and movies and things like that, how do you fund your projects? I know most people do GoFundMe now, you know, that's an avenue, but what's another way that your projects can be funded? Right now, I would I would tell somebody just starting, don't even think about funding. Okay. And I know that sounds crazy, but because of this. Cell phone? You have a camera. <laughs> oh, yes. Yes, you do. You have a camera, you can create content with this. I have a microphone (laughs) that I got for this. I have a tripod that I have for this. I bought some lights for this. A lot of people get overwhelmed with thinking about money and funding and what camera can I get to do this? And it's just like, I I tell people all the time, work on story, (laughs) find something that you're passionate about telling and craft that. I think people want to see potential. (laughs) They want to see room for growth. They're not expecting you to be Oscar winning 
filmmaker the first thing that you make. So start small, <laughs> work with the resources that you have. We were maybe four projects in five. The example was the first time we went out and actually did crowdsource funding. Okay. So I started making films in 1999. So it wasn't until 2015 <laughs> that we went out and asked other people for help. So mm -hmm. this was coming out of our pockets because we love what we're doing. And we also realize that we have to invest in ourselves. It's true. If you're not investing in yourself, why are other people going to this? And mm -hmm. it goes back to the Charlton Pollard story. They mm -hmm. supported their own. Mm -hmm. and then people from the outside came in and did the same thing. Well, it's... I remember talking to Judith Lindsley and a couple of people outside of the Charlton Pollard neighborhood that would talk about coming in and seeing artists that performed on the chitlin circuit. <laughs> they provided value. <laughs> yes. They provided entertainment and people would come from other areas to be there. What value are you providing when you're creating something? How is that something that a creative would know that I'm providing value? Is that just something innate that you know, or is it someone from the outside that comes in and says this has value? I think it's twofold. I think you have to feel good about what you're doing and have the confidence, not the ego. <laughs> the confidence that you know that it's in a good place to where I can share this with the world. Regardless of what the world says, I'm confident in what I did. I enjoy the process of doing this. Okay. I'm doing this because I love it. Because people are going to say whatever. Mm -hmm. And sometimes throughout the criticism, you're going to find those nuggets of praise and value from other people. Don't take anything personal. The compliments or the criticism. <laughs> that can be hard. Most definitely. Yeah. Do I get in my feelings at times? Yes. <laughs> Is this going to stop me from doing what I love? No. And again, it took me years to get to this place. That was about to be my next question. Yeah. How long did it take you to get there? <laughs> Depending on the project. <laughs> <laughs> it's a place that I visit and leave. And yeah. <laughs> Come and go. Mm -hmm. Okay, as we are getting ready to wrap up this interview, what word of advice would you give creatives who are watching this, who are listening to this, who want to do what you have managed to do? Find a way to do it. Sometimes we look at what we don't have <laughs> and that's preventing us from making progress. Look at what you do have. Okay. Build your story around what you do have, the equipment that you have access to the people <laughs> that are willing to help you start from there. So if you're looking at it from a poverty mindset, <laughs> it's going to be a barrier. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so my final question, and you have been an outstanding interviewee. You're kind. My final question is, who do you think would make a great guest on the podcast, but you have to help me get them on? Do you get a chance to talk about the other passion, which is uh, 
Latin dancing. So I've had the opportunity to host and instruct different Latin dance events since the mid 2000s in this area. So I'm going to recommend that you talk to Michaela Marino at Alegria Latin Dance. Excellent. I think that's going to be maybe the second kind of artistic person that I'll have a chance to speak to, but the first person with Latin dance. So I'm excited about that interview. Thank you so much for sitting down with me. Thank you so much for welcoming me back home <laughs> to LUTV News Studio. Your story, your movies, your documentaries, we need that because we need the history to be told. So thank you for doing that for all of us. Well, again, thank you for coming in and also allowing me to talk about the things that have come from this space and the people and the talent and the work that we're all doing, <laughs> you with this podcast. People need to recognize that story <laughs> as well. Absolutely, absolutely. And thank you so much for joining us and listening and watching. You can get this podcast and all of my other podcasts on YouTube Podcasts and Apple Podcasts. And remember, you always have time to listen and learn on the go.